Um, and as I just said, today's seminar is on property 2022, and this topic is going to cover a whole raft of different property issues um, looking into um, this year and onwards, and we'll touch on commercial and industrial, um, residential outlook, as well as highlights and new legislation that will come into effect next year, um, which Mitch will tell you about, but I can only say give a nasty um, tax that property developers are going to need to be aware of. We've got three fantastic speakers today. Uh, Mark Berentas from Catherine Gilbert. To my right, uh, Matt Nichols from Nichols Strata. We'll take us through residential, commercial, and industrial aspects of real estate. And Mitch Bagley is a land agent property, and he will get um, the legal issues associated with uh, the new windfall capital gains tax legislation. Um, just a few pieces of housekeeping too before we get going. Um, we're happy to take questions uh, throughout the presentation or at the end. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, if you're viewing remotely, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Um, the bathrooms are through reception and to your left as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark uh, for a task. Mark is recognised as one of the most successful project marketers in Melbourne and with more than 25 years' experience and is the director of Castro Gilbert in South Yarra. He has relentless work ethic, attention to detail, and understanding of the residential market is the reason he's so successful. And he has sold uh, projects all over Melbourne, ranging from student accommodation right through to high end departments. And I'm sure he's going to tell us about the breadth of his work in his upcoming um, presentation. But interestingly, Mark is also an award winning movie producer. I was told to keep that you know, on the download, but he, having produced movies like Measure for Measure, and he's currently focusing on a new movie, which he may be able to talk about later. So please welcome up. Uh, good to be with you all this morning, and um, hopefully what I share with you today gives you a bit of an outlook as to what is happening in the rest of the property market. And I think it's even more relevant to what's going on with the government in the So it's going to become more relevant as to potential policy changes that are happening uh, in, in the marketplace coming into 2022. I'll tell you a little bit about, we'll talk about my movies later on, but I'll tell you a little bit about Caston Gilbert Real Estate. Caston Gilbert was actually one of the first project marketing companies in Melbourne. In so essentially, Casper and Gilbert and Central Equity, we were the first two that started. And the whole concept back then was that you had to wait till a building was finished to sell it. So we devised, developed the concept that you can actually sell it off the plant. So we, uh, we started the concept, we sold our first project off the plant. Embark and spread Carlton out of a tent. And I've been with the company since 1997. So I've spent a little bit going on since then in a few different cycles, which I'll share. And part of my thoughts today we would like to that. Um, so also I'll give you ideas and the right to all be um, going forward. And also, as I mentioned before, you watch one of my films on my first scene for every three minutes you watch. Okay. All right, so let's talk about um, there's a lot of bad things in play at the moment, and it's really relevant. And when you read the newspapers, obviously the relevancy, particularly with the new government, uh, rising interest rates, uh, you know, people are saying, well, what do you think? And I get asked often, you know, a few times a day, where do I see the market heading? So it's relevant what we talk about today. Um, you know, one of the first things is consumer confidence and disposable income. What we're seeing at the moment, and it's interesting who you talk to, but I'll tell you what I'm seeing on the complex. 
um, consumer confidence is still strong. Now, what we're seeing that is a result um, in disposable income is you just have to look at, for example, the second hand car market. You know, uh, my, my car is worth cent more than what I paid for it two years ago. What that means is that, yes, there's a, a, a limited supply of vehicles coming in and we're waiting, and some of you might have cars and water that you're waiting for more than six to 12 months. But what it also shows is that during the COVID lockdown, is that spending habits were obviously reduced and their savings ability improved. And you're seeing that being reflected in, you know, I mentioned the second-hand car market, the new car market, but also what we're seeing is it relating to the property market. Is particularly with interest rates. And we have to remember, and I'll get to interest rates in a minute, but you know, where we were at four or five years ago compared to where we're at the moment is still historical lines. We've got to keep that all in perspective. But what I'm seeing at the moment um, in the residential market is the, this increased spending, uh, uh, savings, sorry, is assisting buyers into the property market. Now, whether that is the first home buyer, the investor, also the downsides. I mean, you've probably seen in regard to the downside of the market um, that, you know, country, you know, open properties, seaside properties, not through the roof. Lifestyle changes. So what we're seeing is the result of COVID certainly assisting and also historical low interest rates assisting many with the market. House prices surges apartments versus houses. Um, we've obviously seen an, uh, an increase in prices significantly over the last few years, uh, both houses and the apartment market. And what I'm going to say is very important, but I'm not going to generalise and say the whole market, because I think different markets segments are paying better than others. I think my company, because we got we sell. Residential projects throughout Melbourne, from us to St. Paul, from Brunswick to Hyatt, to Mernda, where I'm going to land in So we've got a pretty good idea in the <coughs> But we're seeing different segments perform better than others. We're not seeing um, any market not performing, it's just that some markets perform better than others. And what you're going to see is that um, I see the apartment market performed better in 2020. Why is that? <clears throat> because what you're seeing about to say is in regards to what it is. What it is is in regards to uh, an impact from interest rate, but also uh, other factors as well too, as I just mentioned in regards to disposable income is that those um, people, yes, interest rates might affect them in regards to affordability and buying a property, but it just means that they're not going to buy a three-bedroom house, they're going to buy a two-bedroom house. Or they're going to buy, uh, you know, not going to buy a three-bedroom apartment, they're going to buy a two-bedroom apartment. So they're still wanting to get into the property market. Uh, and see is that... Um, that is certainly going to be a factor coming into this year. I think if you read, there was a great article on AFA yesterday that talked about exactly what we're talking about is the strength of uh, the market at the moment. Yes, there are rising interest rates, but, but investors also may be made as well too because um, there is also a shortage Supply. And I'll get into that in a minute because there's another factor that is about to hit play. And probably some of you might have seen that within your businesses. Um, I'll get into that in a minute. First home buyer incentives. Uh, what, where I see, we've already seen it in play. We've already seen the Labor government as part of their policy uh, introduce, about to introduce policy for first home buyers. I think we're going to take a step further. I think what you're going to see or in this year, policies like the first home buyer grant to stimulate the market. 
to make sure that the affordability, particularly the is there. So I think, in essence, if we, if we go back to what the period of, say, uh, post-2009, 2010, I think you will see similar incentives in play coming into the end of towards the end of 2022. So the Labor, Labor government and house prices, there, uh, as I mentioned, uh, new pol uh, their policies are only first time by us, single parents and low income earners. And so the whole concept idea of this is to get them into the market sooner and, and essentially creating 30,000 extra affordable homes. The other fact, and this is relevant at the moment, is in regards to interest rate hikes on property developers. So what you're seeing, particularly when you look at um, the, the apartment market, there are a number of factors in play. They hold, the developers' holding costs are more significant now. So what you are starting to see are uh, rates, also building costs as well, so which I'll go into more detail. Also, the impact of the lockdown. So, what we're seeing is reduced demand and delays in new projects coming in the marketplace. Costs, and then I'll change with the developer yesterday. He said, Mark, I'm going to have to, you know, my prices have now increased 30% since in the last 12 to 18 months. But these are all factors that are in play that will happen. What that does, yes, we will see some price increases, but also what you will see is a decreased supply of product to the marketplace. What we then have is another factor, <coughs> an important factor, um, migration. Um, I think what you'll see, particularly with the Labor government in play coming in, migration is going to really spot over the next two years. And basically, the fundamentals, and you have to live somewhere. Is there enough product in the marketplace? So these are factors of demand and supply. So you're going to have this migration effect. You're going to have the first home buyer factor. You're going to have invest, the investor market, which are high disposable income, still in play. So what you're going to see is because of migration as well too, is that essentially it's going to do two things. It's not only going to drive the residential property market pricing up, as well as construction costs, but also what you're going to see and it's going to entice the investor market to come back into the marketplace, even more so, is increased rental yield. And that is already in play at the moment. It's already been predicted that over the next 12 months that we will see an increase of over 20% yield in rents. So where is that all in play? Um, it means that we're in for a steady period I know some people have said that, you know, there's a downturn coming. But the factors that I'm talking to you about today, um, there's not enough demand, uh, supply to meet demand. International property, um, uh, and I think we'll see if we look at Melbourne on an international scale as well too. You know, hence with opening up the borders, you know, China, India, you know, they're still relatively, you know, affordable. And so I think you're, that market has been missing to a certain extent over the last few years. So I think you're going to see it come back significantly. And I think if you see the rhetoric of the Labor <coughs> government even over the last 24 hours, particularly with China, they're wanting to embrace them to come back in. So I think all in all, I would think, I think that certain property segments will perform better than others. I think we're in for a steady period in both residential sales, but also the rental market as well too. Thanks for my Netflix at the moment. <laughs>
It's some one of the some of the here. Thank you, Hans. No, not yet. That will come in later. <laughs> All right. Uh, any sense of where um, probably bad in my well, I think so you're going to be willing to stay, but I think that if there's two factors in play that don't back to what I was talking about before. Construction costs are going to be going up. But the, the developers cannot not live the prices, not significantly. So what you're going to see that across the board. Of course, there's a limited supply. The market government offer is creating incentives for buyers to get into the market. So it's it's that first home buyer type incentive. Um, also, government, and this is what gives the, the investor market confidence. They have signaled they will not change the negative gearing regulations. Very important factor in, in regards to stimulating the investor market. So I think all in all, yes, there'll be you've seen some price hikes increases. So I think we'll be absorbing stimulus through the government, uh, but also like the supply. Mm -hmm. No, the new understand. I think, yeah, but it's not. And next step is Matt Nichols. Um, Matt is managing director of Nichols Crowder, the largest commercial and industrial <laughs> agency in the southeast. And they manage approximately 2,600 tenancies and transact around 650 properties a year for the team of the <laughs> Um, they've doubled the number of transactions during COVID as the go-to agency. Um, Matt is a third generation in real estate and has been in commercial and industrial market for 35 years and has lived in Jakarta and Singapore. Matt also plays golf, surf skis and is known to do what some people might say silly things including ultra marathons or cycling across the Simpson Desert in 50 degree heat. It's very impressive. Um, he's also learning the piano. Um, so with that uh, random and varied introduction, let's have a look at Matt's insights, which is commercial and industrial market. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My, uh, my uh, mother, she uh, got a piano when she was 18, oh, sorry, 16, wasn't allowed in the house until it went from black to, uh, to white. From 72 years later, she passed away, and my wife said to me, why do you have a piano? I don't know how to read music and all that type of thing, but anyway, it's a lot of fun. All right, my world's very different, <coughs> yeah, from that point of view. So you heard the introduction, I get to see trends, I see lots over 35 years. The, that, the reason to give you those numbers, 650 transactions, 2,600 tenancies, a really good sample of what's actually happening in the marketplace. What, you heard this from Mark, what you read in the newspaper <coughs> is actually happening, and it happens big time with the commercial and industrial market. So I'm going to give you a couple of nuggets today, and you'll hear me, I'm not actually going to show you graphs and prices and all that, I'm actually going to give you a talk about trends. So let me tell you an old real estate sign, and this is really important. Property market's going to change, it happens on a day, and it did change in November 2021. So when you're going to go and put that money on the horse, just sit there and say, why would the property market to change? If it's going to change, it does happen on cut days. It's been going on for years. All right, so what actually did occur? We age, put these bills in, that's a little like anyway. <laughs> Consumer sentiment, sentiment has started dropping and it's continued. And that has a really big impact. Read them in the paper, and you're going to see where this is going to impact and which, which sectors have actually uh, caused the problem. The stimulus money has watched through the economy. It worked really well. It was a fantastic thing that John Peake and all that type of thing has now actually watched through this little normalisation coming into it. We started to realise that we spent lots of money, boats, caravans. To give you an idea, in we also do a lot of projects, commercial, industrial, businesses, uh, so they say, look, I need this for my staff, but by the way, I need some extra room to put my boat in. Uh, we said, all right. 
holiday homes. My wife said to me in 2020, it was about May, and she goes, I think we need a holiday house. And we also saw when you heard the numbers, we actually doubled the amount of transactions we could during COVID. It was a massive movement, all right, from that point of view. People didn't spend a lot of money. They get to a point where you can't think that skinny bar at that one time. You were sitting with paper bills. Prioritisation. You can hear me talk about demographics in the moment, but we're all meeting there and we've heard it all for mm, what's important in my life, prioritisation. I've actually seen people do the tree chain, sea chain, you actually already know they've already come back. It's good for two years. Worked, all right, from that point of view, prioritisation is really good. And this all impacts my world. It means continuing supply chain, hiring, you know about it. We've got this COVID hanging over. I'm going to be over there. It's really interesting what we're seeing the business owners out there. They're going, hey, I've got my business through COVID, but I've got my team through COVID. Cool. Supply chain, hiring, I'm over it. And we can hear you talking about demographics. If you're 60 years of age above, I'm taking all the time on it. You can sell the business, close the business to them. So it's pretty interesting trends. All right. So then we're going to talk about what I believe is the biggest problem, the biggest problem out here in business is productivity. In an office context, I'm going to cover this in the warehousing context as well. I want to pay rise and I'll work at home two days a week. Just had a fascinating conversation talking about how as a business leader, how we can handle that. Now, I've had some wonderful team, and especially the older ones, who have actually I've got more longevity out of these guys, right? Because they were actually thinking about retiring, and now they're working at home more, they're loving it. Uh, coming to the office. But we're seeing the other aspect to it, certainly with the younger generation under 30, and that's having a big impact for business owners that are in the office context. Mm, yes, what am I doing? Got to create new office supply. You know, and I'll talk about how we're actually producing that. Office culture, engagement, mm -hmm. inclusion is really under pressure. I shared a moment ago that we've got a fun ambassador in the office. Really important. We don't have a fun ambassador, which we want to do a choice for the fun ambassador. But, so we have an Easter egg hunt. We've been doing it for years. You know, Valentine's Day, they get chocolates and learn from that. You've got to get engagement from these guys. It's having a big impact on the office, mate. Pressure on accountability and responsibility. KPIs. We have a really big thing about the KPIs. And KPIs are changing a lot. I went to a conference for one or two years. You mentioned in our industry, previously, it was... You know, wake up in the shower and you've got 10 things you're going to do today and you're going to make 20 phone calls. No, this conference is completely different. It's all about reading, mindset, media, meditation, all that type of thing. Completely changed. So KPIs are not all just about financial. This reprioritization process is about sourcing full time labor. Real problem. Right? This labor issue is just is a real problem. So, migration, just on the movie go, just keep in mind, it takes us 25 years. And the birth of a child to get them really economically productive. The premium migration takes the two or three years. Migration's been a real piece. This problem, problem, uh, problem with productivity as far as we can see it, supply chain issues. And it's very interesting. It's always very interesting about supply chain issues, it is because if we drill down a little bit further, you know, we've got the labour issues that. You could not get a pallet four months ago. Yeah, you think, what do we need a pallet for? Well, you can't put something. It's got to go on the floor. You put it on the pallet. If you can't get a pallet, you have a problem. And that caused a massive problem for these warehouse guys. Containers, 40 foot containers for $20,000. They're down down to six. And a lot of these guys are now sitting and saying, no, I'm going to still pay eight. I just can't have my supply in front. I'll pay extra to make sure it gets there. But it was actually, you know, these containers were costing enormous amounts. This is the biggest problem. They were getting dropped off at Singapore, and the ship was being rerouted off to the US because they were paying $20,000 per container. So all this stuff was stuck in Singapore, right? We couldn't actually get stuff here. What was happening there is that the warehousing guys were now doubling their orders, so when they got the stuff in, it all arrived in the warehouse, and they needed more warehousing space. Great for me. But at the end of the day, you'll sit there and think about all of these things that you read in the newspaper actually in the front of it, that it's certainly in my world. But I've got to remind you, this consumer spending is dropping, so you all the stuff in the warehouse, the consumer's not going to buy it, it's stuck. And that's not a good thing. It will not be as positive as in the residential. 
Now, this is the biggest hammer. So, I've got a few nuggets today. So, I've got one of that cut This is my second nugget. This is really important. Business owners managers hammer. Self consciously, business managers will make a decision about their four walls. This firm here, as an example, will make decisions because the four walls will have them. And I'll go, oh, I don't know if you're going to find a business that's going to really fit people in. It's more subconscious than anything. But I can tell you every time a business takes on more space than they require, they will fill it with good stuff in 12 months. Every single time. So it's just really important if you're thinking about the premises, they are always expanding. Your business will go to another level. That's my nugget number two. All right. Let's have a look at a couple of these sectors. Industrial market, the industrial has been the market, um, it will continue, but it has been quite short. So, some sort of 2,000 square metres, they now want to. We've got four, we do not have the space. So, yeah, that is absolutely flying. And what's interesting is it didn't break stride during COVID because most of the goods made legal, legal, whichever. But what's interesting is they've also had all these you know, sort of supply chain issues and still in the market down. So once all of this starts to wash through and get, you know, get going and rail gets away, this industrial market will really move. Prices have increased 50% since June 2020. Rentals have actually increased 20% in the last 12 months. Is that sustainable for a business? Well, that's going to be, that's a pretty tough thing for these businesses for a company that rental will increase 20%. The good news is that some of my landlords are sitting there going, yeah, the tenant's pretty good, that's not good. Let's have a look at the sector, another sector as far as what's going on the retail sector. I'm going to say it actually survived the Mason Rule. They got really hard. New hospitality is open. And I've got to say, this new hospitality is going to be It's pretty good. All right? It is really good hospitality out here. Themed, all that, and it is really quite amazing. So there's a whole lot of hospitality happening. In, and I'm talking the suburban market. It's really impressive. It's also happening here. But the big sectors were medical, health, and beauty, where the growth sectors, medical products, we just have a program, all right? And there's all the other aspects of it. So we're doing the opening, you know, certain leasing, selling a lot of medical related goods. Health, obvious. That type of thing, so health aspects come into it, and beauty. In particular, for women to be able to now really appreciate the fact that we actually get the nails done, hair done, you know, you would find a daughter cutting my hair, you know, doing that. So you really did appreciate that health of you. They were really big uh, aspects. And prices, rentals, type of as well. We then talk about the office sector. This came off a really low notice. We're all locked down, all that type of thing, but it's the big improver. Back to work, but close to home. We reprioritize. Okay, that's a huge factor. That's a big thing for these city firms going on here. The big firms, and they're going to have to look at satellite offices. Has it actually occurred? Do I sit there and say, yeah, they've done this and all that? I'll use, you know, I'm just picking from Ernst and Young. I know there's a whole lot of auditors, young auditors, sitting down this year, right? They're sitting down baseline. We need some, they need some. For all the other reasons I mentioned, engagement and so on. So I reckon there's a huge amount of potential happening in that. But the space we're all losing out, every landlord has to fully figure it out. What does that mean? Desks, chairs, everything goes in there. Years guys walking in with computers. That's how we're missing the space. And it's the only space that's actually been left. The focus is obviously on staff improvement and retention. That's really good. Uh, so, big market, it's nice and obvious. We've got a couple of years. Rental buyer, got to be in some warehouse, 500 square metres in uh, in Rada, old style. It'll cost you $60,000 in rent, plus $1.2 million. We're going to sell it for 1 1.5 mil. On the last location, 1.5. LBR loan the value ratio of 65%. I'm not selling funding, but 65%, 4% interest rate, which is the number. Your interest only is 40%. It's cheaper to loan than to rent if you have the equity. Okay, so just really important to put on the numbers. And then you go and have a check to your account with your chicken beans in the super fund, find the company, put some money, whatever. Also important to cover. I was asked to cover this anyway. Here we go. Here we go. House or warehouse? Well, right. from a house point of view, my view, you get about 1.5% return for taps. 
typically get a one year lease in my guide, those new retail uh, re residential tenancy laws. <laughs> Now I'm biased to think you <clears throat> But your warehouse, your net return is going to be three to five percent. Yes, we're going to be in warehousing three percent. Right, but that's going to start to push out a little bit. But three to five percent, you will get a three to five year lease, ten plus your warehouse. And that's that. And you're going to get fixed rental increases. So that's my theory on the difference between two. I will say this can be seen as a point. And boring is cool. Oh, there you go, I'm one of those friends. I'm going to get a slide with you, Ben. I don't know what to do. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, well, that's going to get you. Right, demographics. Right, it's a big factor. You've got to think about this in your own businesses, from that point of view, but think about it in the context of your business owner, right? staff, think about the client, your customer. We're all going through this big prioritisation. I'm generalising here. Go to 60, I'm over it. I'm over it. That's what you're seeing me saying right now. I'm going to close down the business. I'm going to over it. We're over it because the supply chain issues and labour. All right? So I'm going to take early retirement. We'll be closing down the business. The property I just sold last week, they'll be closing down the business. No, it wasn't worth it. Over 40, really, really considering what's important. I'm going to have really interested in that problem. You still got to pay the rates. Okay? At some point in time, and that's going to be a really interesting challenge for the leaders. Leadership is going to be really important moving forward because you can imagine the grey hair, that kind of list, what do you mean? Get back in the office, what do you mean? Want to spend time with you? You know, a newborn child, you know, one of the trees, the nappies, all that sort of stuff, right? We just think about it. and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of it is the better for us. And we've got to, we've got to think about it. Over 20s, struggling with this a bit. They're sitting there going, I'll take the money versus the learning. And they are being offered lots of money at the moment. And I'm getting them back in to the office. And it's going to have even learn. Through osmosis, it's gone. All right, winding it up. This is my, hopefully, yep, my son. Business landscaping has changed. And it's going to continue changing. Don't think it's going to go back to normal. It's going to continue changing. So when my office got locked down, yeah, you know, it was a lockdown one, is I said to all my staff, don't break Facebook here. And it's small. Because I saw my competitors, they're at Porty and the holiday house doing whatever, growing Facebook and doing all that sort of stuff. I get the team on board and see what happens with the So you also can see this, and it's going to continue changing. Don't think it's going to happen. Productivity is your biggest issue. You've got to think about it. It's in an office context, it's in every way that think about productivity and what it means for your business. I'm going to tell you that's the biggest problem out there. Demographics, I mentioned, you've got to understand it and think about where it's in that. Take on more space than you think. You might sit there and say that's serving, but I can tell you it does work. My commercial industry might be boring, but boring is good. And change creates opportunity in the base. So hopefully, I'll give you some insights. And uh, some friends about the English from Master Thank you for listening. Yes, Thank you. One question of the team, where you've been doing work, um, the tenants and I'm doing COVID on the And you think now that that's, I guess, pretty much come to an end, are you seeing an effect on the market for tenants, for example, now that they're required to repay their deferred rent in addition to um, their normal rent? Such a good question. We actually did very few deferments. We had a view very early on. So to give you some idea, we did 972 uh, agreements in lockdown one. So it was huge. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting, we made a decision about the deferments not to do, we did the waivers, but not deferments, because we looked ahead and went, how and how after this are we going to be able to still pay an additional amount of money on that? So we convinced our owners to just forget the deferments, it's going to be fine. And so we've actually, through that process, we actually have to have to do that. We're very few tenants. Mm. Um, I guess from our perspective, we're still sort of helping some of our clients negotiate their way through that, um, especially with the rent relief that sort of the small period that started January to March. Um, so it will be interesting to see what happens when 
all of the disputes are resolved um, because there is enough other businesses to work on going and be that the small business can see um, if yeah, there is issues between the landlord and the tenant um, moving forward. So, and just give one of the numbers we mentioned. I mean, in 2,610, I do not believe we've got any new gate for that building. Um, so, I think a lot of it is being a little bit smarter at the top, at the front end, and being a little bit business like to sit there. My landlord's going to raise uh, during that process. I did laugh when I heard about the Bank of Sydney and 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 and go to the uh, let's go and more footy him. I was also amused by uh, Kim's warehouse, and they did write to me and say we want that relief. Fine, didn't even bother. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> What if I'm wrong with the bank? <laughs> 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 it was more the fact that, uh, you know, if they didn't have facial hair uh, beforehand, and, uh, you know, I just didn't want them in holiday mode. There is no more questions for Matt. Um, our next speaker is Mitch Bradley, who's one of our partners in our property team. He's one of our uh, young rising stars. In addition to being a lawyer, he's a keen footballer with Old Scotch and he's enjoying his time in the sun as a Melbourne supporter, which let me tell you, he hasn't let us forget about. Um, he's unfortunately too young to understand the 57 years of pain that he's filed with through the Melbourne supporter. Um, but his topic is on the new legislation to try and protect his view, which is on the Report Capital Game Tax. I want to give more of a phone answer to that. Yes, the Liverpool uh, game tax. So that was given our uh, royal seats um, in 2021. Um, so the good, the good news about this is um, it, uh, comes, it comes into effect um, in 2023. But unfortunately, that's where the good news finishes. Um, uh, everything else is vanished from this point onwards, really. Um, uh, essentially, what it is is um, any land that falls within a red zone area um, receives an uplift that creates some info gain, and uh, therefore the, the taxman or the tax person um, will get the tax, um, assuming um, the increase um, is more than 100,000. Next slide. So, the initial 100,000 um, uplift is uh, thankfully tax free. Um, but uh, between 100,000 and 500,000, um, if the value increases, it's a 62.5% uh, tax, thankfully. <laughs> um, beyond 500,000 increase, it's a 52 tax. So, uh, hopefully, if the increase was $200,000, uh, it would be taxed 62,500. Um, if the increase is uh, $500,000, it would be taxed 250,000. Now, this is payable uh, at the time um, this takes effect. So, uh, if it's rezoned on January, uh, July 1, 2023, it comes into effect. Um, you can defer that payment. Um, so, it, it's, it's either uh, payable um, when the, when the um, due, due transaction occurs, so when you sell the property, or you can defer it up to 30 years. Um, but unfortunately, um, that will obviously be charged an interest rate. So uh, it's currently that it's a 10-year bond rate. So late last year, that 10-year bond rate was 1.5%. Um, two weeks ago, it was 3.1%. Uh, and as of yesterday, it was 2.7%. I'm afraid from if that's changed. But um, it's anyone's guess um, where that will go to. Um, but I think everything we've sort of heard this morning is sort of um, indicating it's probably going to go up. So... Um, the uh, another more bad news is if you do receive an unfavorable valuation um, on your property, you've got two months to object to that valuation. So, um, and, and unlike um, stamp duty or land tax, the commissioner actually doesn't have discretion to allow late um, objections. So, um, I think we just touched on before with um, COVID rent relief, so we actually found that. Um, they were unreal, a bit slow to some 
start that process of getting the rental rate. So um, I think that'll be interesting to see what happens there with two month period. And it's pretty small, so I can sort of see how it is there, but we'll see what happens. Um, you also assess on an aggregate basis. So if you've got multiple titles affecting the same um, windfall gain tax event, um, you can only claim that first 100,000 tax spread um, one, uh, one, one. Um, exemptions. Um, so there's a couple of them which are uh, helpful. Um, so you're exempt up to two hectares of residential land. So if, you, if it's under two hectares, then uh, this one apply, which is great news. Um, uh, there's also some uh, rezoning that won't trigger um, the people going tax. Um, so these include when you rezone between schedules, so in the same zone, so a neighbourhood residential zone from schedule one to two, that one impacted, um, and also re, uh, rezoning the urban growth zones, so land which um, they can growth area infrastructure, uh, contribution area, they, they, um, um, if the first rezoning occurred um, after July 1, 2023, um, of the land urban gate area, uh, okay, uh, area, um, the urban core tax, and uh, rezoning between different public land zones, and then, uh, interestingly, uh, also, if the, uh, if the treasurer may declare, um, then you would be excluded. So this would be interesting to watch there, what discussion they can do there. Um, and lastly, but uh, I guess notably, um, land owned by charity and exempt, except this must be used exclusively for charity purposes for 15 years. Um, interesting, and the reason why it's interesting is there was a very um, relevant um, matter um, in the Supreme Court in 2021, um, Melbourne University, whereby the uni didn't have to pay uh, land tax on land that it released to a third party uh, for, for development for student accommodation. Now, obviously, that, uh, that third party was a charity um, and they didn't have to pay tax on that. Um, interestingly, this, there's some commentary in, in this um, is a potentially a little bit overturning this decision. Uh, because the Windfall Gain Tax is going to amend the Land Tax Act, which is required to this amendment. So, just to see what happens with gradual distributions, and then occupying that one. It's going to be a charity of purposes, which is, as I said, using the schools of the land. Yeah, very much. Yeah. 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 So I guess importantly from what we're saying, this commences at least July 2022. Um, and there are some transitional arrangements in place where if the rezoning um, has already started or taken effect, or if there's contracts of sale that are already in place, um, then they will be treated differently. But there is a certain area which we would, as lawyers, obviously in defence, um, where the, the people are going to get um, stung for this tax where they've um, entered into arrangements or they've undertaken certain um, steps to rezone the property, not knowing that this is coming in, and they are probably going to, unfortunately, um, next year get stung with that tax. So um, it is important for developers um, that are looking to rezone land and sell um, to make sure that um, they've obviously done their appropriate due diligence um, on themselves, I guess, before they um, go into that process. So I'm actually, is there any questions for Rich? Um, a couple of questions from our webinar, if that's all right, for Matt and Mark. Um, so the first one's for Matt, and it is, are there any trends in certain parts of Melbourne? I.e., what is happening in the north with warehouses versus small manufacturing or south? Great question. So what we're seeing in, I don't do too much in the north, but it's big. They're big warehouses. Uh, the freeway system is a little bit better uh, over that side of town. So uh, we're just seeing a lot of very large transactions. It doesn't mean there's no small business owner. Um, but what we've also got to keep in mind, the Australian economy, 85, I think it's 85% of people actually employed in businesses that supply. So yeah, the answer to it is in all of Melbourne, there's certainly some areas where there's more than one or two or three businesses operating. Um, so I know we're seeing clients come to us, um, new mums and dads generally, with construction contracts for a house 
and it's not a contract, and the builders come back and said, oh, it's, this slab's going to cost another six grand. Or actually, I don't need another 30 grand for this because, you know, there's been a delay for four months and we can't get these products. In, I guess, the work that you're doing, are you seeing um, developers with those sort of increased costs and is there an ability for them to pass those on if they've already signed off the contract? That's that's one of the uh, important points when we uh, sell a part of the plan that we ensure that the service um, could be into the sunset post. So there's a period from when they sign the contract, usually probably within like five years. And the banks also ask for the swap for development plan. So there's that that sort of that period uh, when they enter into a contract that they can't change the box. Uh, that's not to stop the remaining stock going. And from my perspective, and you're free to agree with me, but we actually a lot of clients that buy the plan, and um, some developers obviously try to cut costs on their way through. And when it gets to the end, the client says, Oh, that's not really what I thought I was getting. That's not what the displays where it looked like. You know, the developers done it. So I bet do you still come to that in the work that you do? No, because one of the things that I make when I'm doing my work with developers is to work with credible ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, that, that then rolls out to, you know, the people who for me, particularly during the off-planet process, we want to get paid as well to serve it again. No. Do you have any more questions? No. How does the how does the calculated sort of each time? Yeah, so there's um there's two other review system um which you know um with swine but um there's 100,000 um, on the property is tax free. But then how is it calculated? In terms of. As in, it's a tax on people backing the CPS. Yes, that's what I mean. It's worth for its own. I think there's a. Property is a check across. But the legality of the percentage of the value of percentage of the gain. So the, the value in what the land was worth before the rezoning and the land is worth after the rezoning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. essentially. So the valuation done on the council. That's why I believe it's somewhere like council. That's where we can get out of the thing, actually. Um, so is that through the value of getting this office? That's through the value of getting this office. That's where it would eventually be. Yeah. 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 All right, well, thanks everyone for coming and thank you to our speakers, Mark, Matt, and Mitch. Um, just a reminder that our next seminar will be on um, Employment 2022. Um, and Andrew, have we got a date for that? Um, yeah. Give me a second. Sorry. <laughs> you had to ask me the tough ones, didn't you? 23rd of June. Which is the 23rd of June, so no doubt everyone will be not doing much on the 23rd of June to prepare for the planning period. And so hopefully we can see everyone here and online. So thank you all for coming today and hopefully we'll see you in time.